1983, President Ronald Reagan first introduced the concept of providing a missile defense shield as a way to protect the United States from the threat of nuclear proliferation by the Soviet Union. Reagan challenged the scientific community to develop anti-ballistic missile technologies that would improve national security and reduce our reliance on nuclear weapons as a deterrent. Raytheon, concurrent with the Boeing company, created preliminary designs that ultimately culminated in sensor flight tests. The notion was that the destruction of an incoming ballistic threat missile would occur by literally flying a kill vehicle through space and into the incoming warhead at a high rate of speed. Because it was always believed the only way you could knock out a ballistic missile was with another nuclear warhead and to blow up a big nuclear warhead. And the notion that you could actually do something called hit to kill was just pie in the sky. That, that was a pipe dream. We just weren't going to do that. Raytheon and the Boeing Company created preliminary design reviews that ultimately culminated in sensor flight tests. The sensor tests, conducted for the first time in the space environment, were designed to identify targets, differentiate between debris and decoys, and send tracking information back to the command center. There was an awful lot of naysayers that said we could never do it. I remember the first time I walked into the, the, the lab in, in 805, it was in the basement, it was, it was dark, there was wires hanging over, there was computers stacked on computers. Um, it was, it was pretty, pretty amazing how they'd cobbled this program together from, from an early concept. The successful sensor test led to development of a hover test. Two, one, one, is disconnected. Zero. One, one. We actually flew inside this, this large tin shed, it turned out to be, with, with this nylon net um, surrounding the inside so you can't crash into the wall. Um, at the hover facility, this was the largest vehicle they, they ever hovered, so there was, there was all the security concerns. They were afraid we were going to fly out the roof of the vehicle and, 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 and across the, you know, the Air Force base there. Once the hover test proved successful, Raytheon received a contract to produce the payload for what would eventually become known as the Exoatmospheric Kill Vehicle, or EKV. The EKV was designed to fly through the vacuum of space and contend with sub-zero temperatures, the vehicle's velocity, space debris, and decoys. Try to imagine teeing a golf ball in Los Angeles and getting a hole in one in New York City. The next critical step in ensuring success of the program was the first attempt at intercepting an actual target. There was only one outcome for our flight test. It was success. You, you had space dust or you had nothing. EKV doesn't have a proximity fuse, doesn't have a warhead, it's, it's all kinetic energy. So you miss, your opportunity's gone. So it really was target on success. Lots of hours. We would come in at 7 in the morning and work till 10, 11 o'clock at night. Um, tremendous schedule pressure. It was uh, almost a round the clock activity. Um, we were learning as we went. I mean, this was the first time we'd really built this flight vehicle. Both Fox and CNN bring their cameras down into the 805 lab and, and videotape a session where they actually interviewed folks and were, were videotaping the team working. So it's, it's the only program I've ever been on where CNN has actually been in the lab with us videotaping. After several delays, Integrated Flight Test 3 was finally underway on October 2nd, 1999. The Building 800 was, was filled to capacity for the, for the IFT-3 launch. There was about five or six minutes where everybody was, was, was on the edge of their chair. After a significant investment in time, people, and resources, the shot into space paid off. We did, and you see this bright flash on the screen. Everybody jumps out of their chair and yells and screams because so many people said it was impossible to do what we did, and we did it on our first attempt. The celebration of success was short-lived when the next flight test took place several months later. Uh, after, after the intercept on IFT-3, we're thinking, oh, this really is going to be a, you know, a good program. This is going to be a good place to be. And then it was shortly after that we, we had some challenges with IFT-4. A failure review board formed shortly after Integrated Flight Test 4 identified an obstructed cooling line as the reason why the payload did not intercept the target. Despite another unsuccessful mission with IFT-5 later that same year, 
the team began seeing progress in its efforts. What we learned through that engineering review board was just uh, amazing um, because it really, the engineering review board really was an EKV 101 because there really weren't any stones that were left unturned. Um, and we, we learned a lot. Um, we, we were able to identify a lot of uh, corrective actions, a lot of root causes. The program also received a boost once it transitioned from the basement of Building 805 and moved into a modern design and production facility built specifically for the EKV team in Building 809. This new production plant now supports multiple programs and has become one of the world's finest space factories. The factory and the workers have also been called a national asset by the customer. Several successful flight intercept tests occurred in the years that followed. The next transition would be to build up the design that would meet all the operational requirements and test it. But the uh, country, uh, President Bush, made a decision. He wanted those operational and put into the ground. And we felt that we knew enough about our design to do that. So even though the contract was called test bed, we were developing and building the initial assets that would both be some tested, some put in the ground, put in the silos. The EKV team began targeting success with the delivery of EKV payloads in 2004 as ground-based interceptors were installed in Fort Greeley, Alaska, and later Vandenberg Air Force Base. The EKV program has experienced incredible achievements and some disappointments throughout the development and deployment stage. There were many rewarding experiences for those who were part of the program. What you, what you learn to deal with is the instantaneous challenges of new things coming up and how are you going to uh, literally decide as a, as a program how you're going to keep going on your priorities as well as how you were going to incorporate whatever you learned that day and how you were still going to try to keep tempo and, and make the delivery dates that you had, you had promised the customer in the country. One constant throughout has been the people who have been part of the team. I was totally impressed with the capability of the people, their attitudes, their, their energy, get beat up a lot, you know, but never give up kind of thing. And that's, uh, you know, that's the thing I think that's, that's going to continue to carry this program forward is that attitude and that, that, that willingness to always accept the challenge. One of the greatest challenges and one of the greatest successes has been taking this EKV design that we were building over in the labs in Building 805 and putting it into a world-class production facility. And it, you know, we didn't get there overnight. It was a lot of hard work from a lot of dedicated people that helped make that happen. But we've truly gone from being able to build onesie twosies to being able to you know, build them in a world-class factory at a good production rate. Today's EKVs are the centerpiece of the nation's ground-based interceptor program that is protecting the nation from long-range threat of ballistic missile attacks. This is not a pie in the sky, this is not gee whiz, this is a capability we have. No one ever thinks about attacking an aircraft carrier anymore because while that capability, hopefully in 10 years from now, no one will ever think about attacking the country with ballistic missiles because they'll be pointless. That smart rock Raytheon engineers created years ago is today protecting our families and our way of life from those who would seek to eliminate this great nation. <laughs>